Okay, well, welcome everyone um, to another TCS Plus talk. Uh, we're really excited today to have Rasmus King from ETH. Well, he'll tell us about um, maximum flow and min cost flow and almost linear time. I know this result has generated a lot of excitement, um, so I'm very much looking forward to it. So before we begin, um, I really want to encourage everyone to keep their cameras on. I guess this will help Rasmus have some visual feedback. And feel free to unmute yourself and ask, um, ask questions. And what else? So next week, we not the following week, but in two weeks, so May 4th, we have another talk from another person from ETH, Vera Traub. She'll tell us about uh, recent developments in graph augmentation. And Finally, let me um, thank the rest of the organizers, um, uh, which include uh, Clement Kanan, Rachel Cummings, and India Day, Sumega Garg, Gadam Kamat, Ilya Rajenstein, Odette Regev, Salil Shram, Noah Stevens Davidowitz, Thomas Vidik, and David Weiss. All right, so without further ado, uh, please, Rasmus, take it away. All right, thank you very much, uh, Eric, and thanks to the organizers for, for inviting me and, and for all of you uh, for coming to listen. And, and please do ask questions uh, along the way if something isn't clear. And we also have time for more questions at the end. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the maximum flow and minimum cost flow in almost linear time. And it's joint work with this uh, amazing team, Li Chen, Lang, Yang Lu, Richard Peng, Max Popes, Gutenberg, and Sushant Sachdeva. And to get us started, I want to think about an example. So we'll think about transporting apples on trains in the USSR, because this is in some sense where it all started. So imagine that some cities have a surplus of apples and others a deficit. And we ask ourselves, how can we most cheaply send the surplus apples to cities with a deficit? And we'll make a very simple model. So a city will rep be represented by a vertex and then we'll have train routes, we'll send things on trains, uh, represented by directed edges between vertices. And if you can go in both directions, you just put in uh, both directions here, right? So both directed edges. So our train routes are directed and they have uh, a cost that's fuel spent per ton of apples and a capacity, think uh, tons of apples per day, but we'll think about kind of steady state routing. There won't be any time component. Uh, and now we can we can take our edge up here and say put a cost of one on it and a capacity of two. Then you can send say two units of flow on it. This means we have a total cost of two times one, that's two. And we're not violating the capacity because we only put two units of flow and we have a capacity of two. Okay, now let's have a slightly bigger example. So here we have uh, two units of surplus up here and two units deficit down here, so we want to send the surplus down here. And I put in a route here, a routing of the flow, uh, which doesn't violate the capacity. So it's feasible, okay? And the cost is six. So just two times two plus two times one. But is it optimal? No, okay? And we can see this by, con uh, by observing that it's cheaper to send down this route here instead. And so we should send as much as we can this way. And now we can send one unit this way, and this routing has a cost of five, okay? But how can we notice in general that this routing can be improved, okay? So I'll give us a tool for this, namely a, a network with what I'll call undo edges to help us improve our solution. So if we have a, an edge with a say cost of one and a capacity of two and a flow of 1.75 on it at the moment, then we'll build a new network. This is called the residual graph, and this has undo edges. So we'll have a no flow in this network to start. Then we'll have an edge going forward with the leftover capacity, which here is two minus 1.75. So there's 0 0.25 leftover capacity going forward. And then a backwards edge with capacity equal to the flow on this edge. So this is how much flow can we take back, okay? And this backwards edge has a negative cost corresponding to the fact that if we reduce the cost, the flow here, then we reduce the cost. Okay, this is called the residual network with respect to this given flow. So now let's look at the residual network here with respect to the flow that we have. 
here we get that the forward edges completely disappear because they have no capacity left. And then we get backwards edges with a capacity of two corresponding to these two units of flow routed here. Now, I want us to think about finding a cycle, so a circulation flow in this network. So that's a flow that has net demand or net flow zero at every node, okay? And now think about adding this circulation to our current solution, okay? This gives us then a different flow. And because this has net flow zero, the new flow also routes our demands, okay? So we add a circulation, we get a different solution. Okay, and we can look at the cost of this circulation in this residual graph and it's minus one. And this corresponds to the fact that if we adjust our flow in the original graph by this circulation, the cost goes down by one. Okay, so looking for negative cost cycles in the residual graph will improve our flow. And if the negative cost cycle respects the capacities in the residual graph, uh, then uh, the new solution will also respect the capacities in the overall original graph, okay? Now, there was one thing I didn't address, which is how do we find an initial feasible flow? But this is easy. We're just gonna add a fake edge where we can route all of the flow from up here to down here, and we'll make it have plenty of capacity. So it can definitely handle all the flow, but we'll also make it have very high costs. So we don't actually want to use it in an optimal solution. Okay, so now we have an initial feasible flow. We can improve it with a negative cost cycles. Okay, so we have these negative cycles that we're looking for, negative cost cycles. And by finding negative cost cycles in the residual graph, we can improve our solution. And also we can show, we didn't show it, but we can show that if there are no negative cost cycles, the solution is already optimal. So this sounds like the beginning of an algorithm. But there's some trouble. So finding these negative cost cycles is difficult and we might need many cycle updates in order to get to our optimal solution. Okay, so let's do a little bit of history. When we have costs only, so no capacities, this is called transshipment. Uh, and this was studied by USSR researchers. So a guy called Tolstoy, but not the author, published a paper on this uh, in the 1930s. And he had this idea of using negative cost cycles. If you have capacities only, this is called maximum flow. And it was studied by Harris and Ross and Ford and Fulkerson in the US in 55. And they also basically used negative cost cycles for their algorithm. But in the case of max flow, the negative cost cycles will always use the fake edge that I added this extra edge. And so they actually look in the rest of the graph like a path between the source and the sink. So they have a bit of a simpler structure. And this is called path augmentation. And when you have both costs and capacities, then this is called minimum cost flow. And this is the hardest version of the problem. So now let's talk a bit about max flow running times. So I want us to think about a graph G with vertices V and edges E. Uh, and I'll say that there are M edges, I'll always use M for this, and N vertices. Uh, and for now, I want us to think about sparse graphs. So that's a graph with, uh, say, roughly polylog degree per vertex on average. I use this O tilde to hide polylog factors. Um, okay, and we'll think about two different cases. On the one hand, the sort of very general case of having integer capacities that range between one and a large polynomial. And on the other hand, just having capacity of one. And a lot of the work often has happened down here first. So Ford and Falkerson for unit capacity gave an M squared time algorithm. Uh, Dinitz and Edmonds and Karp uh, gave an M squared algorithm for general capacities independently. And then in a very nice uh, kind of breakthrough, Karsanov and even Antarjan independently showed that actually Dinitz's algorithm runs in roughly m power 1.5 time in unit capacity graphs. So this is very nice. Uh, it took a long time to get the same running time in general graphs, okay? Uh, but finally, 20 years later, uh, Goldberg and Rao succeeded and made this work in, in general capacity graphs. And this was kind of the end of an era for maximum flow algorithms. So let's talk a little bit about kind of general properties of these algorithms. 
they have a combinatorial outer loop, which is this finding of a residual graph, and then a combinatorial inner update. And the outer loop iterations in the slower algorithms are say M, and the fastest are square root M. And each time it's, as I said, computing a residual graph. Then we have the combinatorial inner update, which always takes at least linear time. And this is finding a path or a cycle update in a directed graph, which is this residual graph. Okay, so now we want to start to understand the next era of, of MaxFlow algorithms. But to do this, we're gonna make a little detour uh, into uh, algorithms for something quite different, more general, namely linear programming, which has a very different algorithmic tradition. Okay, so we all know linear programming. We could have say two variables, x1 and x2, and maybe they're required to be non-negative. Then we can add some more linear constraints, say like this. Then we get some kind of feasible region, uh, the region where all the linear constraints are satisfied. And then we usually have an objective along the lines of uh, minimize uh, some linear function. In this case, go as far in the direction of this green arrow as you can. And this is the optimal solution for this linear program. Okay, and Danzig gave the first great algorithm for this in 47, it's the simplex algorithm. And it works like this, you start with an initial solution, which should be a corner of your polytope. Then uh, you look for an update that moves you to a different corner of the polytope and improves the quality of the solution. And this is a lot like finding a negative cost cycle, okay? And you keep doing this until you reach your optimal solution. But unfortunately, in the kind of combinatorics of linear programming, this ends up giving us exponential time in some cases. So people wanted a polynomial time algorithm, but this ended up requiring a very different kind of approach. So I put a little alien here because this is not, nothing like the combinatorics that we've seen so far. And I'll call these numerical algorithms, okay? And this was first achieved polynomial time by Katyan in uh, 79 with the ellipsoid method. Kaimaker then analyzed an interior point method in 84 and showed that you can make one that is more faster even than, than ellipsoid. Uh, and Renegar gave an even faster interior point method that we call path following interior point uh, in 88. Okay. And what do these interior point methods do? So, um, they try to encode the constraint that a variable should be greater than zero or some other linear function using what's called a barrier function. So here we have this B of X. It should be a function that goes to infinity as the variable here goes to zero. So as we start to violate the constraint, okay? And this should then prevent us in a minimization problem from setting the variable to zero. So here in our linear program over here, we can add a barrier for the constraint that X1 should be greater than zero. And then a constraint, a barrier for the constraint that X2 should be greater than zero. And we keep going at our linear constraints and the corresponding barriers until we have a sum of all the barriers for all the constraints. Okay, now we have a smooth function inside the feasible region with the property that it goes to infinity if we get close to violating any constraint. Okay, now we also have this objective function that we want to minimize. Uh, and so the way Karmaker deals with this is he adds a term that makes sure that if we approach the optimal objective value, then the function goes to minus infinity. And he does this by subtracting a barrier term that is a function of the value gap to optimum, okay? And all these things together now give us a potential function that is minimized at our optimal point and goes to infinity if we go anywhere else that violates a constraint, okay? Now, what we want to do is try to minimize this potential function. So we start with some initial feasible solution x0. Then we construct a local approximation to this which additionally has the property that we know that in some region, it is guaranteed to stay feasible. So it stays inside the feasible region, this local approximation. Uh, okay. Then we minimize in this region where we know it's feasible uh, to give us an update delta. We add delta to our current solution. This gives us a new solution. Okay. Now, what is this update? It's a Newton step update. 
This means that we make a Taylor series second order approximation to our potential function x plus delta. There's a linear term and a quadratic term. This has the Hessian in there. And then we minimize this, uh, this quadratic approximation. This gives us our Newton step update. This is equivalent to solving a linear equation just by taking the gradient of this quadratic function to be zero. Okay. Now, solving a linear equation is time consuming, but it is polynomial time. Okay. So this gives us a polynomial time algorithm if we don't need too many updates. And indeed, we'll now make another local approximation, take a step, and we keep doing this until we get close enough that if we want, we can round to an optimal solution. Okay, so very different than the MaxFlow algorithms we've seen so far. But then in 2008, Deitch and Spielman gave a new MaxFlow algorithm. And they observed that if you take an IPM, an interior point method for the MaxFlow linear program, they were looking at Renegar's path following interior point methods. And you look at the Newton step, you can make sure that this corresponds to a problem which is called routing and electrical flow. But this is something that we can do very quickly thanks to a breakthrough result of Spielman and Tang in 2004. So this is what their MaxFlow algorithm is. They say we take a path following IPM, which has roughly square root M updates, so taking these Newton steps. And each update is solving an electrical flow, which thanks to Spielman and Tang, we can do in nearly linear time for an altogether running time of roughly M power 1.5. So this matches up to polylogs, Goldberg, and Rao. Okay. But it's very simple in some sense. You just plug it into this existing interior point method. It also does min cost flow, which means it gave the first improvement for min cost flow over an MN up to polylogs time algorithm by Goldberg and Tarjan in 87. Okay. Now, there's one thing that's quite mysterious here when you first look at this, which is, what is this electrical flow? Can you give some kind of natural interpretation of it? And Madri eventually did this. He said that we can actually set up the interior point method so that what's happening is that we're sending an electrical flow in the residual graph, but we make an undirectified version of it. And this undirectified is crucial because these fast electrical flow algorithms, they only work in undirected graphs. Okay. So what does this mean? It means we, we know how to build a residual graph. We take our graph with a flow in it. Then we reduce the forward capacity as we should. And we add an edge with backwards capacity. What's now the undirected version of this? It's that we just take the capacity in both directions to be the minimum of these two capacities, okay? And uh, this is an effectively undirected graph for the purposes of this electrical flow, okay? Um, now, this maybe is something very important about what interior point methods do. They sort of avoid committing entirely to sending the full flow, like going all the way to maxing out the capacity. So there's always gonna be some capacity in both directions, okay? So this is something interior point methods do. They make it possible to think about uh, this undirectified version of the residual graph, okay? So what's good about this update? Well, kind of at some high level, instead of adjusting one cycle or a few cycles with, with each of our updates, an electrical flow touches every edge in the graph. So it's some kind of very global update. And maybe this is why it can do min cost flow in these square root M iterations, okay? And Spielman and Tang, and that then starting with Deitch and Spielman, this all led to kind of a revolution in graph algorithms and we got 15 years after Deitch Spielman of kind of increasingly clever global updates that made better and better algorithms for, for various special cases of maximum flow. Okay, so now let's look at some history of this modern era of maximum flow. Okay, some running time. So we got Deitch and Spielman with this M power 1.5, okay? And this alien algorithm, nothing like the combinatorial algorithms before. Then Madri, in the unit capacity case, lowered the running time somewhat. And Kathuria, Lou, and Sitford 
brought Madri's approach to what is in some ways its, its natural conclusion and gave a unit capacity M power 1.33 time outlook. Okay. Uh, this builds on, on P norm flows as the inner loop, which is an even more powerful numerical primitive, something that uh, Richard Peng, Sushant Sachdeva, and Di Wang and I worked on. Uh, now I want to talk uh, about some other recent algorithms that mainly are interesting if you have a lot more edges in your graph than you have vertices. So now you should think about a denser graph. Lee and Sitford gave an algorithm in 2014, which then runs in M square root N time. And uh, all of these algorithms work by taking an interior point method and then doing something very clever to reduce the number of outer loop iterations, okay? Then uh, in some recent works, the running time was brought down to uh, actually nearly linear for sufficiently dense graphs, okay? But with no improvement in sparse graphs. And then finally, uh, in the last couple of years, there was a very small improvement over Goldberg Rao in the general case. So this is about 0 0.017 um, improvement in the exponent. And so it's looking hard with these approaches to push all the way down to almost linear. But what do these things do? They reduce the IPM inner update cost by dynamically maintaining the electrical flows along the way. Okay, so they reduce the cost of getting all of these electrical flow updates, maintaining what the solutions are in some data structure uh, approach. Okay, so now let's compare these two different eras of algorithms. So over here we had in the combinatorial era, a combinatorial outer loop and combinatorial inner update. In this numerical era, we have a numerical outer loop and a numerical inner update. The outer loop is now an interior point method and the inner loop is an electrical flow or something even more powerful, where before it was a residual graph and then pathfinding in the residual graph. We had combinatorial outer loop iteration starting at M and going down to square root M. The IPM outer loop iterations started at square root M and went all the way down in some cases to cube root M. And then we had combinatorial inner updates that took at least linear time. These numerical electrical flow inner updates are either electrical flow or LP norm flows, and they have been brought down slightly below linear in sparse graphs. So that's what finally gave this. But you can see it's looking hard to push this down. Okay, this uh, cost of the inner update. So how do we finally get almost linear time? We use a, an almost linear number of iterations in our outer loop. So this is a lot more than over here. The outer loop is numerical. It's what I'll call an L1 IPM, and we'll see what this means soon, whereas this was L2 IPMs, okay? So that's our outer loop. The inner loop is combinatorial, like the combinatorial era, but it's now in an undirected graph instead of a directed graph back in this era. And then finally, we give a dynamic algorithm for the inner problem that solves each inner update in almost constant time. So M to the little of one. So this is the huge win, okay? We take lots of iterations, but each iteration is extremely fast. Okay. So now I want to talk a little bit about the flow optimization problems that we solve. So we have seen a max flow linear program. Let's, uh, let's look at the example. We have a source S with some incoming uh, or flow going out and a sink T where it should come in. And we had this fake extra edge where we put all the flow to begin with. And we can write a linear program for this by saying we, we need a flow that routes the demands, respects the capacities and minimizes the cost, which is just uh, there's only cost on using this one special edge up here. So we want to use as little of this edge as possible. This is maximum flow. Now a minimum cost flow linear program just allows you to have an arbitrary linear cost on every edge. Okay. But we can actually generalize this a lot further to what I'll call a convex flow program, which gives you a convex cost function 
on every edge, okay? And we'll get uh, an almost linear time algorithm for these as well with one uh, technical restriction, which is that this cost function, they can be different on all the edges, but they should be convex with an efficient self-concordant barrier. This is a very mild restriction for this one dimensional input here. So basically any sane convex function will satisfy this. So we get almost linear time algorithms for all of these. So what do we get as applications? Direct applications from max flow and min cut give us min cost by part type matching. Worker assignment, optimal transport, directed flows with vertex capacities and costs. By some recent reductions, we also get undirected vertex connectivity. We also get negative weighted short paths and flow diffusion and more, okay? And then by switching to this convex flow framework, we also get weighted p-norm flows. We get entropic regular, entropically regularized uh, optimal transport, matrix scaling, isotonic regression, and more. Okay. So now let's build a Karmaker style interior point method for a flow problem. And we'll take our maximum flow linear program from before. So we can write out this respecting capacities as each flow should be non-negative to respect the direction of the edge, and it should not exceed the capacity some number UE on the edge, okay? Then we can add barriers for each of these linear inequalities. Mm -hmm. So we have a barrier that blows up to infinity if the flow goes to zero to violate this inequality, and a barrier that goes to infinity if the flow starts to approach the capacity, okay? And I want to point out a, a little connection with the residual graph, namely with if we have here capacity two going forward, flow of 1.75. In the residual graph, we have two edges with capacity 0 0.25 and capacity 1.75 going back. So the, this is just the forward edge residual capacity and that's exactly the input here. And this is the backward edge residual capacity and that's the input to this barrier function. And if we want to make an undirectified version of this capacity, we just take the min of these two capacities as the capacity of the edge. Okay. Oh, and there's one more thing, which is that in this Karmaker approach, we need uh, the objective to go to minus infinity if we really manage to bring this variable to zero. So we just plug in a barrier that goes to minus infinity if this goes to zero. Okay. Now we have our potential function. Okay, so, and we want to minimize this. And I want us to consider that each barrier is just minus log of its input. That's not actually the barrier we use, but it's very close. So morally it's doing the right thing. And this is the standard barrier that people use for interior point methods. We need something a little bit different, but it's very similar. Okay, so now let's think about the Hessian of this potential. It's a diagonal matrix. So we just need to think about diagonal entries. And this is just one over the flow on the edge squared plus one over the forward residual capacity squared. And now I'll define the length of the edge to be one over the underrectified residual capacity. Okay. And then the Hessian, uh, this diagonal entry is just the length squared up to a factor two. Okay. And I can further simplify this by saying, let's make a diagonal matrix with the lengths on the diagonal. I'll call this big L. And then the Hessian is basically just L squared. And now remember that we want to use a Taylor expansion of our function to choose our update delta to make progress. So we'll make a Taylor expansion and we'll make sure it's an upper bound by scaling up the Hessian term, the quadratic term a little bit. Now this will be an upper bound provided we look at delta in a region where the Hessian is fairly stable, okay? And we can get that the Hessian is sufficiently stable if we just make sure that the update delta in each uh, entry divided by the undirectified residual capacity, which is the same as multiplied by the length. This quantity on every edge in absolute value should be at most 0.1. Okay, then the Hessian will be stable and the upper bound will apply. Now let's observe a few things about uh, kind of how to think about this. So this is actually the infinity norm of L delta. 
And this thing up to a constant factor is just the two norm squared of L delta, okay? So now we have that if the infinity norm of L delta is less than 0 0.1, then uh, the potential function is upper bound by this nice quadratic upper bound. And then I just want to remind you that F routes the domains and we want to make sure that F plus delta also routes the domains which means that delta has to be a circulation. The update should be a circulation, so it doesn't change that we route the demands, okay? And now these things lead to a standard L2 interior point method, which is that we want to pick an update, uh, which should be a circulation delta that has a large negative inner product with this gradient. So this should be a negative number with big absolute value compared to the L2 norm after the scaling by L. So this will be a good update direction. You need to scale it appropriately to minimize this. And this update is an electrical flow calculation. And this is how we end up with needing to do square root M iterations of this making this update where each update is an electrical flow. But sorry, Russell, okay. is, it, is it clear it should be square root M from this? Uh, no, no, no. I, I don't want to claim that this is clear. Um, but the intuition in some sense is that uh, what, what you're trying to do is that you're trying to kind of work in an L infinity box, which you then approximate with an L2 box. And then you need to scale it down by a factor square root M to account for kind of the fact that an L2 ball poorly approximates an infinity norm. And this gives this kind of that your updates have quite small norm. Uh, and so you need square root M of them. Okay, but th that's a good question. Okay, so we're gonna make a kind of deceptively simple change here. We're gonna make an upper bound that's even worse. Instead of using an L2 norm here, we'll use an L1 norm. And then L1 norm is larger than the L2 norm. So this is also a valid upper bound. Okay. This gives our L1 interior point method. Okay. Where the direction that we're looking for should have a large negative inner product with the gradient compared to its L1 norm after scaling by L. Now, this is an even cruder bound, which ends up meaning that we need to scale down uh, the step even more in order to make sure that it stays feasible. This is required for feasibility, okay? That L delta infinity norm is less than 0 0.1. So we need to scale it down more. We're taking smaller steps. This box is smaller, uh, but now there are L1 steps in some sense. And we call this problem min ratio cycle. And we need, because we take smaller steps, square root M iterations. Uh, sorry, M iteration. So now it's linear and that's worse, okay? Why am I calling this min ratio cycle when it says here, uh, find a best circulation? But it's a nice exercise to realize that min ratio circulation, this L1 problem, is always realized by a simple cycle, okay? And that's quite important. So. Uh, basically, it just comes from doing a cycle decomposition of this circulation and then realizing that one of these cycles has at least this good a ratio, okay? And then after we put this paper online, we realized that in fact, uh, already in 92, a quite similar L1 IPM for min cost flow had been developed by Wallacher and Zimmerman. Now, this doesn't really get them started on getting a fast algorithm because they were then just trying to minimize this problem exactly. Whereas the crucial point for us to get a fast algorithm is going to be that we'll solve this very, very crudely. And we'll also need to think a lot about uh, stability, by which I mean that the sequence of problems that we're solving are closely related to one another. And these were not things that Wallacher and Zimmerman were, were thinking about. But it's still very interesting that they got a lot of the kind of outer framework right already in, in 92. So now let's talk about stability. So if L delta is less than 0 0.1, we got that this Taylor series upper bound worked. But the real reason for this is that 
if L delta infinity norm is less than 0.1, then the gradient and the lengths or the Hessian are stable in some useful sense. Okay. So how are we going to ensure that, that our update satisfies L delta infinity norm is less than 0.1? We're in fact going to do it by making sure that the one norm is less than 0.1. Okay. So this is like very, very conservative in some sense, because the infinity norm could be much less than the one norm. Okay. So we'll scale the update down until the one norm is less than 0.1, and then certainly the infinity norm is less than 0.1. But this uh, then does something good for us that we scale it down so much, because now I want to ask, how does our sequence of mean ratio cycle problems look? So up here, we were talking about whether the gradient and the length are stable under uh, taking this one update. But we'll in fact argue that there's a lot of stability in terms of the whole sequence of updates once we scale them down like this, okay? So given that the one norm of the update is small in this sense, the total number of significant changes in a coordinate of either the gradient or the length, which is basically the Hessian, is bounded by roughly m, so the total number of changes, roughly m, across the entire interior point method. Okay. So this suggests that if it's enough to lazily update the gradient and the length whenever it changes significantly, we'll get that our min ratio problem is changing slowly. And this is exactly what we show. Okay. And this then suggests that we should treat it as a data structure problem. And that's exactly what we'll do. To maintain the solutions to this min ratio uh, circulation problem, given that these inputs, the gradient and the length are changing slowly. Okay, so we have our L1 IPM with this min ratio cycle problem that needs roughly M iterations. But now the total number of lazy changes in a coordinate of the gradient or the length is bounded by roughly M up to subpolynomial factors. This then means that we have M instances from our M iterations with on average few changes between them. And we're then going to maintain these delta solutions for each of our updates via a randomized data structure. Okay. Now I'll talk a little bit about some data structure challenges here. I won't define all the terms. So this is maybe the rest of the slide for data structure experts. Okay. You can tune back in in one minute when I'm done with the slide if, if this doesn't mean anything to you. But there's a really key point here in trying to do this with a randomized data structure which is that we do not get an oblivious adversary problem. This means that the updates that we choose to make influence what is the future problem that we need to solve. And this can make working with randomization very, very difficult, okay? And it's very unlike a lot of uh, kind of easier data structure problems that you get if you assume that the updates that you make are independent or the outputs that you make are independent of the, the sequence of input changes. So this is very challenging, okay? Now, we ask then ourselves, what could go wrong? So the adversary is not oblivious, what could go wrong? And one of the things that could really break the randomization is if the optimal circulation is changing very quickly, okay? But we show that it's not. We show that in fact, Delta uh, given by F star, the optimal min cost flow minus our current solution is always a good min ratio cycle, not optimal, but very good. Okay. And this is a very strong promise, which means that we're not working against a fully adaptive adversary. And this then helps us a lot in making sure we can actually build a randomized data structure and sort of. Uh, puts us somewhere in a very interesting place between an oblivious and an adaptive adversary. And I think there might be a general lesson here that could go a lot beyond uh, even graph algorithms to say here that often when you're doing optimization, you might be able to get an interesting adversary model that is not oblivious, but it is also far from being fully adaptive. And this is important for, for us. 
Okay, so now if you are not a data structure person, you can tune back in. And let's briefly compare three algorithms for minimum cost flow. I'll hide subpolynomial factors, and I'm focusing on sparse graphs. So Deitch and Spielman, we heard, gave an algorithm with square root M updates. And the time per update was linear roughly, and the update was an electrical flow. This was the first improvement for min cost flow over Goldberg and Tarjan with M updates and M time per update. They had a directed negative cost cycle as their update. Now our new algorithm has again, roughly linear number of updates, but almost constant time per update. So this is the huge win, okay? So where's this coming from? Well, the update is now an undirected negative cost cycle, and we show that it's sufficient to approximate it very, very crudely. And this then means that we can leverage for our data structure, very powerful approximation theory for undirected graphs. We also need to build a lot of new approximation theory. And I think there's, there's a lot of kind of interesting stuff there that we only get to touch the surface of. But in particular, we're very good at approximating undirected graphs with either trees or with, if they're dense, with sparser versions of the same graph. So now I want us to get started in understanding how this might work uh, by, as a warm up, thinking about finding a single approximate min ratio cycle using random trees, okay? So this is just finding one cycle, one single iteration of the algorithm. And the key ingredient will be probabilistic low stretch trees where there's a lot of important work starting with Elon, Carp, Peleg and West in 95. Uh, the guarantee that these trees give you is that you look in your graph, you sample a random tree using edges in the graph, then for every edge in the graph, if you look at the tree path between its endpoints, the expected length of the tree path up to polylogarithmic factors is the length of the edge. So this only holds an expectation, but it holds for every edge in the graph. So now let's look at a graph and suppose this is the min ratio cycle in the graph. And we want to find another cycle with roughly this kind of uh, gradient, similar, and roughly this kind of length, or at least roughly this kind of ratio. And this gradient uh, should be a large negative number, but I think it's easier to think about a large positive number. So I, I put absolute values around here. Now let's suppose we sample a, a probabilistic low stretch tree in the graph. And let's think about the sum of the lengths of the tree paths of the edges going around this optimal circulation or optimal cycle. But by linearity of expectation up to polylog factors, this will be bounded by the length of the edges summed around this circulation. Now let's add also the lengths of these edges in here. We still have a polylog upper bound. We just added one more time this, okay? But notice that this is now the length of the tree cycle associated with this edge. And by tree cycle, I just mean the cycle that you get if you take an edge and then close it into a cycle by looking at the tree path associated with the edge. Okay, so now we have that the sum of the length of the tree cycles is bounded by O tilde times the length of the optimal circulation when we look around these same edges. Okay. And then that was an expectation, but by Markov's inequality, I get the same bound with a factor two extra loss by with at least probability one half. Okay, so let's say we have this. Now let's think about the gradient of a tree cycle, or sorry, the sum of the gradients of the tree cycles around the optimal uh, circulation. Okay. This turns out to be exactly the sum of the gradients around this optimal cycle itself. Why is that? It's because every these tree paths get used twice. So every tree path gets used twice in opposite directions. So the gradients here cancel out exactly. First we get it with a plus sign, then we get it with a minus sign and the two cancel. Okay. So the gradients are exactly equal 
and the lengths of the tree paths are not much worse. But then this means that up to polylog factors, the ratio between the sum of these gradients of tree cycles divided by sum of lengths of tree cycles is larger than the optimal ratio up to polylogs. But then just one of these tree cycles has to have a ratio at least this good. Okay, so now one of these tree cycles has a good ratio up to polylogs. And this happens just as long as the random tree gets this guarantee, which happens with probability at least one half. So now we just check all of the edges of the tree. If we find a good cycle, we're happy. If we don't, we just sample another tree. And we need to do this at most log times to get a, a good cycle with high probability. Okay. So now let's look at the overall algorithm. I've sort of sketched most of it before, but let's just take another look. We start with an initial feasible flow. We then have a data structure that maintains a few trees, enough trees that we find a cycle with high probability, so log or something, or it's actually almost subpolynomial. Then for a, a sub, sorry, a, an almost linear number of iterations, we identify in each iteration a circulation that approximately gets this min ratio uh, value. And it's going to be represented as a tree cycle in some tree. Okay, then we update our flow by adding some scaling of this tree cycle. Okay, and it's important that we're doing it using a tree because this cycle might actually be very long. So combinatorially, you might not be able to afford to write it down, but we can use a tree data structure to make sure that we can still update flow along this long path. Okay, then you lazily update the gradients and the lengths and you update the trees and then you make another iteration and you keep going. And then in the end, you return your final flow. Now, the very hard part that's left over here is how do you update these trees? Okay. Uh, and also I lied a little bit. It won't always be a single tree cycle that we return. Sometimes it has to be a union of a very small number of tree cycles. Okay. So now we need a tree that you can update quickly. And a key idea will be to build the tree partially. So partial tree building. And this has a lot to do with kind of important prior work on J trees. And we're going to only process a subset of the edges and vertices. Think about say 99%. Then we'll recursively construct the tree for the rest, 1%, okay? Then we'll do partial tree maintenance, which means at the top level where we already have our partial tree, we need to survive through maintaining this tree under 0.01, so 1% M updates, and then we'll rebuild. And whenever an edge changes, we'll kind of give up on handling it at this level and then pass it into a deeper level. But this gives us at most another 1% of the edges updates to pass down. So this adds up to 2%, which the deeper levels can handle. Okay, and then we rebuild. This creates a lot of challenges. There's a recursion here that should reduce the number of vertices and the number of edges. And we need to, because of this, maintain vertex and edge sparsified smaller graphs at the deeper levels. But these smaller graphs are now undergoing complex updates. In particular, we have edges that are changing. And because of how this vertex sparsification, reducing the number of vertices, because of how that works, we also need to deal with vertices that split, okay? And this requires developing a lot of interesting new tools for dealing with sparsification with respect to vertices and edges in dynamic graphs that undergo these complicated updates, okay? Now, we have a little bit of time before we start questions. So I'm gonna just give us one little other sample of an important step related to this edge sparsification. So we skip ahead to a bonus slide here. So I want us to think about edge sparsification. So we have a graph G, uh, we have our optimal circulation, which is hidden from us. We don't know what it is. And the graph is a bit too dense. So we want to throw away some edges. We're going to do this by computing a spanner of the graphs. 
This is a subgraph with few edges where the distances are approximately preserved. So all the distances are approximately preserved. Remember, we we're doing L1 norms, which are distances. So this, this is kind of the right object. OK, but now when we sparsify our graphs by throwing away the non-spanner edges, we have a problem because we might destroy the optimal circulation completely. OK, but we know that in a spanner, there's a way to uh, make an embedding of every edge using every edge that we remove using a short path. OK, so now let's think about embedding the optimal circulation using these short paths, okay? This is not guaranteed to give a good min ratio cycle. The gradients here are totally unrelated and they might be terrible. So it doesn't work, okay? But now I want us to think about the cycles that I get if I take each edge that I remove and then it's spanner embedding cycle. Uh, it's spanner embedding path. This closes to a cycle. Okay, and now an important lemma is that either some spanner cycle is a good min ratio cycle on its own, or if all the spanner cycles are bad, then the embedding of this hidden optimal circulation is still a good min ratio cycle and we can find it recursively. Okay, so there's a bunch of other challenges we need to deal with. Uh, in order to build the data structure, this was, was just a sample of one of them. But with that, uh, let me say thank you for listening. Uh, and thank you, of course, to my amazing team of co-authors. Uh, the archive link is here, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Okay, well, thanks, uh, Rasma. Um, yeah, anyone feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions. I actually had one question. If you could say a little bit more about this model between fully adaptive and completely oblivious adversary. Yes, yes. So let's, uh, let's skip uh, back to this. Um, so we get this promise that a pretty good circulation, good enough, is given by the optimal circulation minus uh, the current solution, okay? But this then ends up telling us, well, we know where is this difference changing, right? We don't know what the optimal flow is, so we have no idea what this circulation looks like, but we know where it's changing because it's only changing where we change this flow, okay? And this ends up basically telling us that we know all the edges where the optimal circulation might have changed a lot. And then we'll basically promise ourselves to, in, like, if this was currently an edge that was kind of maybe being poorly handled at the top level, it might have been quite poorly approximated, some edge where now there was a big change in the flow. Then we'll say, pass this down to a deeper level in this recursive structure, which then gives us a way to make sure this edge is now being very precisely handled. So basically, we'll be able to guarantee that on all the edges where it's possible that the optimal circulation uh, has changed a lot, we now are not just using kind of maybe a bad tree to approximate these. We're now very closely approximating the true routing on these edges. So we get to be very conservative on the edges where things might have changed. And this gives us a lot of power to show that the kind of things work out well. Uh, it still ends up being a bit tricky uh, kind of getting the formalism right. Uh, so, so this is kind of a, uh, there's something in the paper called hidden flow, uh, hidden flow chasing data structures, which, which deals with this. Uh, does that help a little? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, thank you. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, okay, so maybe I'll stop the recording in case people want to ask questions without <laughs> going on yeah, YouTube. Sure.